I want to give you a little review of some things that took place just before the year 2000. You know, I am not one that reads tabloid newspapers. In fact, I run as far from them as I possibly can. I recognize that their news is sensational and uh, most of the time fictional. But back in 1996, I was walking through the grocery store, and as I was, I looked over and I saw a tabloid newspaper whose headlines were Bible predictions for what's going to happen in the year 2000. Now, as a Bible student, anything that says Bible predictions, and as a teacher, certainly caught my attention. So I began to look through this particular tabloid, and it said, in the year 2000, in the month of February, millions will convert to Christianity. I thought, my, that's pretty interesting. And then I looked at what would supposedly happen in February. In February of 2000, there'll be a record heat drought across America, and thousands will die. I said, well, that's not too good. And then I took a look at what would happen supposedly in the summer of that edition of the newspaper that was put out in 1996, and it said the stock market would crash and the Antichrist would rise. I said, wow, these are some fanciful predictions. Then, supposedly in September, there would be a mile-high image of Jesus Christ over the United States Capitol. I mean, this was getting more interesting all the time. Then this one really fascinated me. It said that in late September, early October, there would be an evangelist preaching and he would ascend to heaven. And I said, maybe I have hope. Maybe this, it's right, you know, maybe I'm, I'm going to go up preaching to some large crowd. And then they said, lastly, by the end of the year, the four horsemen of the apocalypse of the book of Revelation would be flying over both Montreal and Toronto to, to climax the year 2000. Well, now, obviously, not one of those things happened. They were simply so-called psychic predictions. I'm here tonight to tell you, though, that the book of Daniel is not psychic predictions. That as we study the book of Daniel, we can look back over 2,500 years and see the fulfillment of Bible prophecy in the book of Daniel. And I will share with you tonight some amazing prophecies. We'll compare those prophecies with history, and we will see exactly the fulfillment of those prophecies. You know, one thing about God, Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10. Can you read it with me from the screen? For I am God, he says, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Now pause there for a minute. What is one of the characteristics of God that makes nobody else like him? What is one of the characteristics of God that enables him to be different than anybody else? Read the rest with me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. One of the things that distinguishes God is that God sees the future as we see the present that he's able to declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. The psychics may guess about the future. The psychics may speculate about the future. The psychics may theorize about the future. The psychics may have visions prompted by Satan about the future. But there is one thing about God. His vision of the future is certain. When we study the book of Daniel, and particularly Daniel, the second chapter, we can look at the prophecy given in the book of Daniel, compare it to history, and have the assurance that the future of this world is in God's hands. We're going to study tonight one of the most amazing prophecies in all the Bible. We will study about nations that God predicted by name that would rise in advance. We will study about an ancient king that was named 150 years before he was born. We'll read his name in the Bible. We'll look at the ancient rock records. We'll study a prediction in Daniel chapter 2 about four great nations that would rise and they would fall. 
We'll study about the history of Europe and how that history has been true for over 1,500 years. And we'll study about the fulfillment of prophecy in the future. Because as we look at the past and we see historic prophecy fulfilled, we can have confidence that that prophecy is going to be fulfilled in the future. So tonight I invite you to take your Bible and turn to Daniel, the second chapter. And we're going to study an ancient king's dream. Daniel had just graduated from the University of Babylon. Now, if you happen to not have brought your Bible, we have one of our ushers, yeah, uh, Matt has one. If you can just raise your hand, we can put a Bible in your hand. Or there should be one in your pew holder in the front. If you're not sure where the book of Daniel is, I really don't want you to be embarrassed at all. When I was 17 years old, I started to study the Bible, and I didn't know where one book of the Bible was. In fact, somebody said to me once, turn to the book of Hezekiah. And I was so ignorant that I thought Hezekiah was in the Bible, and it took me almost 20 minutes before they were laughing, one of my teenage friends, to, for me to know it wasn't there. I thought the book of Psalms was called, called the book of Palms, you know. And I'll turn to the book of Palms, you know. I didn't know anything about the Bible in those years. And so if you don't know, never feel embarrassed about what you don't know. Simply uh, ask somebody next to you, can you help me find this particular verse in the Bible? So we're looking at Daniel chapter 2. The book of Daniel was written 600 years before Christ. Now how do we know that the book of Daniel was written then about 2,600 years ago? Well, when you look at Daniel chapter 2, for example, it says now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, we know that Nebuchadnezzar began his reign in 605 BC. So we, have the, we can compare what the Bible says to the ancient records of Babylon. Now it appears that there is a contradiction in the Bible in Daniel 2 verse 1. What, did, what is that apparent contradiction and how can it be solved? Daniel was taken captive in Nebuchadnezzar's first year, that was 605. Daniel was in the University of Babylon for three years, which would make it the third year of Nebuchadnezzar, not the second. Why is that apparent contradiction in the Bible? And why do I mention it? Many people who read the Bible, read the Bible superficially. They see something that is an apparent contradiction, and they say, I can't have confidence in the Bible. How do you reconcile the fact that Nebuchadnezzar began to reign in 605, he reigned for three years, Daniel was in the University of Babylon, then this vision took place in his third year of reign, not his second. Why does the Bible say second year? It's another evidence that the Bible is inspired by God. The Babylonians never counted the accession year as a year. So a king would rise to prominence that would be called his accession year, the year he rose to the throne. Then he would start ruling first year, second year. So it was his third year of reign counting the accession year. This is another evidence that the Bible is inspired that Daniel wrote this 600 years before Christ because how would Daniel know this if he wasn't living through Babylonian history? With that brief explanation, we go to Daniel 2 verse 1. In the third year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. So here you have an ancient king in the nation of Babylon. And there, he, the ancient king goes to bed one night and has a dream. Incidentally, this is the Ishtar Gate going into Babylon. I was just a few weeks back in the Pergamum Museum in Germany. Pergamum Museum is an amazing museum. Robert Coldaway uh, was the German excavator of Babylon. And Coldaway went down, he excavated Babylon, and he took, they took these tiles and the Germans put them back together and reconstructed the Ishtar Gate. You see this uh, jackal-like figure, Let's see if I can point it out to you. Um, let me go back one for you you'll see this jackal-like figure. Um, and I want you to see it here. Here we go. You'll see this jackal-like figure. And it's on the, it's, if you look at the beasts, 
you see the right-hand column, the one in the middle. He is the god Belmarduk. And Belmarduk was the chief of the Babylonian gods. When Daniel's name was changed, it was changed from Daniel to what? Belteshazzar. And Belteshazzar means the keep, keeper of the hid treasures of the god of Bel. So when Daniel, at 17 years old, was marched into this most lavish kingdom in the world, he looked up and saw images everywhere of this god of Babylon called Bel Marduk, the god of Babylon. Babylon was an amazing kingdom. It was an incredibly lavish kingdom. The river Euphrates ran through the center of Babylon, giving it a constant water supply. The walls of Babylon were so wide that two chariots could race side by side on those walls. Babylon had a 20-year food supply within the city. It was one of the most fantastic nations in all of the world. Nebuchadnezzar went to sleep one night, and he had a dream. He woke up the next morning, and he couldn't remember his dream. How many of you have ever gone to sleep one night, and you've woken up, and you tossed and turned all night, but you couldn't, ha and you woke up and you, you couldn't remember. You knew you had a dream, but you couldn't remember it. Can I see your hands? Oh, yeah. Now, maybe you were eating too much pizza the night before. Your stomach was growling, you know, or maybe you ate too much Chinese food the night before, or so that I'm not singling out one particular group. Maybe you ate too much uh, uh, American potatoes or French fries. I don't know. But you ate too much. I will guarantee you that Nebuchadnezzar was not eating pizza, he wasn't eating too much spaghetti, and neither was he eating too much Chinese food. Nebuchadnezzar wakes up, he has this incredible dream, he can't remember what he dreamt, but he knew that that dream was extremely important. So what did he do? The Bible tells us exactly what he did. In the second year of his reign, now let's review, why is it the second year of his reign, not the third year of his reign? Because what? They did not count the accession year. Great students. He had dreams. The king summoned his magicians, his enchanters, his sorcerers, astrologers. You need to see this in the Bible. Daniel chapter 2, you're looking at verse 2. Daniel 2, verse 2. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams so they came before him. Now we need to look at those four groups, the magicians. Who were they? The Babylonian magicians would often kill a cow, take the liver of a cow, cut the liver in half, and come to the king with the liver cut in half, and they would read the patterns in the liver, the design in the liver of a cow, and try to predict the future. The other thing the Babylonian magicians did was they'd take a drop of oil and drop it on water, and you know, if oil's dropped on water, you know, it gives a pattern. So they would read that pattern and read the future. So you've got the magicians who are trying to read these signs. You've got the astrologers. Now, these are not astronomers. They are what? Astrologers. And these astrologers are trying to look at patterns in the stars to read the future. Do you know that there are 3,000 astrology columns in American newspapers today? And some people get up and if they don't look at their sign, Sagittarius, or something else, they don't want to begin the day. The astrologers in Babylon could not reveal the future, and the astrologers today can't reveal the future either. So they're the magicians, the astrologers. Now the sorcerers, who are they? The sorcerers try to communicate with the dead. So that's who they are. So the king brings in all the people he thinks. Now there's quite a crowd there. Now notice it says magicians. Astrologers, plural, sorcerers. So he says to the magicians, go ahead, bring me the cow livers. I don't care what you bring me. Tell me, what did I dream in my bedroom and what does it mean? He, brings, he tells the astrologers, I don't care what you do. Read those patterns in the stars, but you tell me, what did I dream in my bedroom and what does it mean? Then he tells the sorcerers, I don't care if you raise five dead people, but tell me, what did I dream? Now what about the Chaldeans? Who are they? You see where it says in, in chapter 2, the Chaldeans? The Chaldeans are the PhDs. They are the intellectuals. So Nebuchadnezzar brings in this large group. I don't know how many there are, but there are quite a few. 
they maybe be 50, maybe we're 75. He brings them into this room and he says, okay, you magicians, drop your oil on water. Tell me, what did I dream? What does it mean? Okay, you guys, uh, cut your calf livers, look up in the sky, uh, raise the dead, uh, educated elite, tell me, what did I dream and what does it mean? Verse 3, you see it in the text? The king said to them, I have a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. The Chaldeans spoke to him and said, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will tell you the interpretation. They came and stood before the king. He said to them, I've had a dream. It troubles me. I want to know what it means. Here's what he knew. Nebuchadnezzar knew the dream was important. Nebuchadnezzar knew the dream was significant. Nebuchadnezzar knew the dream had eternal significance, but he could not understand what that dream meant. So they came and they said to him, King, no problem whatsoever. You tell us what you dreamt last night and we will tell you what it means. Now I'll tell you, any dream you had, you just come to me and I'll tell you what it means. I mean, I may be totally wrong, but I can guess at any meaning. Right? Yeah. You see, the king was too smart for that business. If these magicians and astrologers and soothsayers couldn't tell him what he dreamt, a few hours before, how could they possibly tell him what it, it meant 2,500 years in the future? So he wasn't going to fall for that. He said, look, you tell me, what did I dream and what does it mean? Now the scripture says something quite fascinating here and you'll find it in Daniel chapter 2 looking at verse 5 and 6. But the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, my decision is firm. If you don't make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you're going to be cut in pieces and your house is going to be made a dunghill and you're going to be really in trouble then. He said, look, if you don't tell me what I dreamt, I'm going to destroy you, I'm going to kill you. However, if you tell me the interpretation, you'll receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell the dream and its interpretation. Now, there's an eternal truth in verse 5 and 6 you're going to miss if we don't spend time dwelling on it. The first thing he says is, if you don't explain to me the dream, I'm going to put a knife to your throat, I'm going to kill you. Or if you do explain to me the dream, I'm going to give you a reward. He motivates them by fear or favor, by fear or favor. There are many people in life that that's what motivates them. If, they, if the boss says to them, either you get with it on this job, I'm going to fire you, they're motivated by fear to do a better job. Or the boss says to them, look, if you do a better job, you're going to get a raise. I will fu and so they want the raise. Many people in life are motivated by fear or favor. And I'd like to suggest to you tonight that there is a deeper motivation to live than fear or favor. Unfortunately, there are Christians that are motivated by fear or favor. They are motivated. They say, I want to do good or right because I don't want to end up in hell. And so they're motivated by the fear of hell to try to be obedient. But if all, the, all that motivates you to live a Christian life is the fear of hell, someday this is going to happen. You're going to want to have pleasures here more than you're afraid of hell, so you'll go for the pleasures here. If all that motivates you is the favor of heaven, I want to, go to, I, I want to leave this world of its sickness, suffering. So if what motivates you is fear or favor, they may be temporary motivations. Sometimes fear motivates a person to start studying the Bible. But if all that motivates you is fear or favor, they're very temporary and they're very shallow. What motivates us? The fact of a God that created us and shaped us. Why do I live? Why am I not a cow? Why am I not a mosquito that I can just swat here? Why are you you? When the genes and chromosomes came together, to form the unique biological structure of your personality, God threw away the pattern. You had no choice about being born, none whatsoever. But you were conceived in the mind of God before you were ever conceived in the womb of your mother. And that which motivates us is a God that created us, a God that fashioned us, a God that shaped us, a God that gave us life. Life is a gift from God. We call the present the present because it's a present from Jesus. And so what motivates us to serve God? First, that he gave me life. 
that every breath I take is, comes from him, that every heartbeat comes from him. I'm not motivated by the fear of hell primarily, neither am I motivated by the favor of heaven. I'm motivated by the graciousness of God who gives me life and I can breathe. Every breath I take is from him. The second thing that motivates me is a God that came from heaven and tabernacled in Jesus Christ and died for me. A God that loved me so much that when the human race went astray, that he came and lived the life we should have lived and died the death that we should have died and that he guarantees us a place in heaven. That which motivates us more than anything else is love. That he loved us so much that he wants us in heaven. That he would be lonely with us forever if he wasn't in heaven. So fear can motivate you for a little while. Favor can motivate you for a little while. But what we need is the deeper motivation of understanding this God that created us, this God that loves us, this God that wants us in heaven, this Christ that died for us, this Jesus that's coming again for us. So King Nebuchadnezzar says, okay, if they can't explain the dream, execute them. In an actual fact, the execution process starts. Look at verse 13 of Daniel 2. Look at verse 13 in Daniel 2. Now, incidentally, before we get there, we should look at verse 10. Daniel 2, verse 10. The Chaldeans, that's the wise men, they speak up. He answers the king, there's not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, nor lord, or ruler has ever asked things. They were so right. There is not one human being. Only God can reveal the future. They're, igno they're acknowledging that. Look, verse 11. It's a difficult thing that the king requires. And there's no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. There's nobody that can explain the future. Nobody can do this except God. And so here now they, they utter, you know, sometimes people whose hearts are filled with falsehood utter eternal truths. And so here are these false soothsayers uttering this eternal truth. Now notice, the decree goes forth, verse 13. So the decree goes forth, and they began killing the wise men, and they sought Daniel and his companions. Why were they sinking Daniel and his companions? Not because they were magicians or astrologers, but Daniel was one of the wise men of Babylon, so they sought him. Now then, with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel says to the captain of the king's guard, he says, look, give me some time some time that I can go to pray. When you don't know what to do, you know just what to do. When you come to the end of your rope, and even before you ever get there, for Daniel, prayer was a way of life. Prayer was something that Daniel did not merely to get favors from God, but Daniel entered into a relationship with God. Daniel knew God. And so the scripture tells us in verse 17 and 18, then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, and his companions. And he sought mercies from the God of heaven concerning the secret so Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And Daniel answered and said, there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he's made known to the king what shall be in latter days. There is a God in heaven. Daniel said, not there might be a God up there, not maybe there's a God up there, not perhaps there's a God up there. Don't you like that phrase? There what? Is a God in heaven. When you see the rise and fall of nations, when you see the confusion of the political systems of this world to know that there is a God in heaven. Now there's something I do not want you to miss. I want you to look at verse 20 and onward. Daniel 2, verse 20. When Daniel receives this answer, he says, Daniel 2, verse 20, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Daniel comes to prayer, and he finds that wisdom and might are from God. What's from God? Wisdom and might. Now notice these two things. When we come to God in prayer, he gives us wisdom that we did not have, and he gives us power to accomplish his role. Let me tell you a little story. We were building this church, and as we were building it, we were about two weeks away from our occupancy permit. And we had understood that the shopping center here would take the responsibility for putting in the lights along the street. About 
nine months to a year ago, a car came down this street and knocked down one of the major street lights out here on the corner. When the county came to us and I contacted the shopping center, they said, you are responsible for the lights in front of your building. And the county said, unless you get those lights fixed, you have no occupancy permit. You can't occupy. It was two weeks before our grand opening. We had to find out first where the wiring system was, but secondly, you don't go down to Lowe's department store and buy one of these lights. They don't have them over there at Lowe's. They're specialized lights. And so as the result of that, we get on our knees. And I remember, I was kneeling in my house here in Dominion Valley, got on my knees up in Regency, said, okay, God, we're supposed to open here in two weeks. I have no clue where to buy one of those lights. I just don't know where to get one. And I began checking around. Nobody seemed to know where you could get one of those lights. And I said, God, you know where those lights are. Even if I order one, I may have to special order it. They may not bring it in for the next month or so, and we're going to be off our grand opening. We've got people flying in. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel gets on his knees and prays. And what does he discover? God, he says, God, wisdom and what? Might are yours. God is wise enough to know the future and empowers us. So I had made friends with the manager of the shopping center here. And as a last resort, I said, I, she probably doesn't know. She was new because the Toll Brothers that owned this shopping center had sold it to Rappaport. So I said, but I'll call her. So I called her and I said, you know, I'm really baffled. Two weeks and, we, and we're going to open it and I don't have one of those lights. Now, her office, she manages many shopping centers and so she's only up here occasionally. And when I called her, she said, Mark, it's really curious that you're calling me. I was up here last week, and we've got a vacant store next to Giant. We are, we are storing things in that store. And she said, Mark, I was in there the other day, and I saw one of those big light poles that you're asking about lying on the floor. And she said, I didn't know what to do with it. I just wanted to get it out of that place. Here's the code. Go with your builder, get that thing out of there, and put it up. Within an hour, I was in that store next to Giant. We opened the door. It was there all the time. God knew it was there, didn't he? God knew it was there. What does scripture say? And we put that up and we opened on time. Wisdom and might are what? God's. When you don't know what to do, you know what to do, right? So it says wisdom and might are his. Now look. If God in Daniel chapter 2 can reveal 2,500 years of history in advance. Do you think he knows your future? Do you think he does? You know, I remember it was about three years ago. And I was on my way to a meeting, driving a car, rented car, and I had a book on the seat, and the book fell off. I leaned over the seat to pick the book up, and I heard a crack, broke a rib. So I uh, didn't think much of it. I was at a meeting where I had a number of physician friends. They checked me out. They said, you know, that was strange. You better watch that. Went to get the rib x-rayed. On the way back, I was at an airport, went to plug in my cell phone, leaned over a chair, and I broke a second rib. Went to my physician friends, and they said, we're sending you to the University of Maryland right now. And I have a friend who's the dean of the medical school at the University of Maryland. So he took me in, got me the top people, checked me all over. They said, Mark, you are so healthy, it's unbelievable. You know, you, all your blood work is good, you're healthy, you're on a good diet, you're 71 years old, you're exercising like everything, you, you, you're in good shape. But they said, we don't understand why you keep breaking ribs. So they said, we're going to send you, after I went through all these tests and blood work and all this, they said, we're going to send you to an oncologist. And I'm thinking in my mind, an oncologist? No, that's not a gynecologist. I don't need that. You know, an, onco you know, an oncologist. I said, that's a cancer specialist. What do they send me there for? So they send me to the top multiple myeloma specialist in the world. The initial diagnosis was multiple myeloma. That was the initial diagnosis. He said, can we start chemo next week or next? And I will tell you something. When you have that diagnosis and you're with one of the top cancer specialists in the world, you begin a lot to think about your life. And I said to myself, God, wisdom and might are yours. I am putting my life in your hands. Whatever my future is, whatever is going on in my body, I'm putting my life in your hands. They were about ready to start chemotherapy and I 
said to the physician, I said, look, I'm praying about this. I'm doing everything natural that I know. And I will do chemotherapy on one condition, Doc. You've got to look me in the eye and tell me I'm going to die if I don't do it. I said, Doc, I don't, my body's not going to be experiment. You've got to look me in the eye and tell me, Doc. So the leading, cancer, leading, chemo, leading multimyeloma specialist, one of the leading in the world, he looks me in the eye and he said, Mark, if there were 10 of the leading specialists in the world, three of them would say, maybe we should treat. Five of them would say, we don't know what to do because you're too healthy. And two of them would say, um, maybe we'll treat you. I said, Doc, that's not good enough for me. Seven out of 10 is not good enough. Eight out of 10 is not good enough. Let's wait. We waited. We had more tests. They backed off the diagnosis. They said, you don't have multiple myeloma at all. It's something you've had just some other problems that uh, with your bone structure, we can deal with that. And here I am. It's flying all over the world 17 times, 16 times, crossed the Atlantic in the next, uh, in five months, you know, healthy as everything. But I'll tell you, it is a wonderful thing to put your life in God's hands. It's a wonderful thing to have that peace that you know that your life is in God's hands, that whatever happens to you. And that's the prayer of Daniel. Go back to that prayer in Daniel chapter 2. We're looking at it in Daniel 2. We're reading verse 20 and onward. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and what? Might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. Isn't that good news? That the destiny of the nations is in the very hand of the living God. Now notice we keep reading that. He reveals, verse 22, deep and secret things. He knows what's in the darkness. Light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You've given me wisdom and might. When you get on your knees to pray, God's going to give you wisdom about your future, and he's going to give you strength to face your future. God will give you wisdom about your future, and God will give you strength to face your future. So Daniel goes in before the king, and he said, there's a God in heaven who reveals to King Nebuchadnezzar what's going to take place in the latter days. So Daniel begins to describe the dream. Look at Daniel chapter 2, please, verse 28. There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. What does God do, everybody? He reveals what? Secrets. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the what days? Latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed are these. So Daniel, the dream that we're going to study takes us from Daniel's day down to the end of time, down to the latter days. It reveals the rise and fall and the destiny of nations. So Daniel begins to speak to the king. Verse 31. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. The image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet and, and of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were crushed together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away, so no trace was found for them. And the stone that struck the image became a mountain that filled the whole earth. So Daniel says, okay, king, this is what you dream. You dreamed of a great image. Now, this is not unusual because these kings often had idols, and Babylon had many idols. It had 13 idols, chief idols, and they were all covered with gold, most of them. So when Daniel begins to describe, you saw a great image, the king says, oh yeah, I saw that image. But then Daniel surprises him. Head of gold, breast and arms of silver, thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. Then you see this rock that smites the image and smashes it down, and this rock becomes the mountain that fills the whole earth. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar must have had his mouth dropping open. He must have said, Daniel, that's exactly what I saw. An image with the head of gold. I saw those breasts and arms of silver. I saw those thighs of brass. I saw that legs of iron. Yes, I saw the iron and clay. Yes, I saw the rocks might be. It's exactly what I saw. You think Nebuchadnezzar was pretty excited? You think he was amazed? Now, if you were Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel just described the dream to you, what would you have done next? What, what would you have done next? What would you have done next? What do you think you'd do? 
You'd give him a lot of gold? You probably, you probably would. At the end of the chapter, he does give him some pleasures. But if he describes your dream, what's your next question? What does the dream mean, right? Now, let me ask you this. There are some people that say the interpretation of prophecy is always up to guesswork. That it's all a matter of individual interpretation. You interpret it one way, another person interprets it another way. So everybody interprets it how they want. Let me ask you the question. Who gave Nebuchadnezzar the dream? Who gave him the dream? God gave him the dream, right? Now, if God gave him the dream, do you think Mike, God might give him the interpretation? If God is the author of prophecy, does God give prophecy to make things complicated or make them simple? To make them simple, right? So if God gave the dream, then God would obviously give the what? Interpretation. Now, how do you think we should discover what this dream means? You think everybody should guess at it. Now, let's suppose that you had never heard this prophecy before. You had no clue what it meant. And let's suppose I said to you, let's everybody guess. So you all write down what you think the head of gold meant. Oh, a rich nation. Uh, the head of, uh, what, what does this mean? And so everybody writes their guess down. Then I get a box, and I pull out the one that we just by arbitrary chance, and I read it, and we all agree that we're going to go with that one. Think that's a good way to do it? If God gave the prophecy, God's going to give what? The answer, the interpretation. So let's see if God does. So we go. Verse 36, you ready to go? This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. Notice what it says. Do you see verse 36? Does it say, I will tell the interpretation? What does it say? We. Who's the we? You got it, young lady. The Lord and Daniel. God and Daniel are going to tell the interpretation. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he's given them into your hand and has made you rule over them all. You are this head of gold. So Daniel looks at Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and he says to Nebuchadnezzar, you, Nebuchadnezzar, or your kingdom Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, or Babylon, reigned for 66 years, from 605 B.C. to 539 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar reigned for about 44 of those years. So Nebuchadnezzar represents the whole kingdom of Babylon. Now, one thing we notice about the image of two things. First, it has descending value. Gold, silver, brass, iron. Descending value, but ascending strength. So silver is stronger than gold, bronze is stronger than silver, iron is the strongest of all, and we'll show you that later. But descending value, it, the, the image becomes, and the ages become more morally corrupt, as we will see. But he says to, Dan, to Nebuchadnezzar, you are this head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was represented as that golden kingdom. In Babylon, there was the temple of Bel Marduk, and Bel Marduk was the chief god of Babylon. He sat in a golden domed temple as a golden god on a golden throne before a golden altar. Eight and a half tons of gold were used in, that, uh, in the inside of that temple. So gold was a very fitting symbol for Babylon. Babylon was one of the nations that ruled the then known world. There were four metals, gold, silver, brass, and iron. So likewise, there would be four nations that would rule one after the other. It was Nebuchadnezzar's desire that his kingdom rule the world forever. We have discovered in archaeology, and here's a picture of it, a letter from Nebuchadnezzar. And it's a very fascinating letter. And in that letter, Nebuchadnezzar writes that the whole world, the whole earth, was prostrate at the feet of his empire. Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar had such an ego that he stamped his name on every one of the mud bricks of Babylon. We've discovered tens of thousands of those mud bricks. And uh, I've held one of the mud bricks with Nebuchadnezzar's name on it in my hands. And so, Nebuchadnezzar 
wanted to dominate the world forever. He did not want his kingdom to be the head of gold followed by another world ruling empire. Another interesting discovery is the what we call the Babylonian Chronicle or, or this tablet. And on this tablet is written, and you can, if you could read the Hebrew language, you would read this here. It says, O Babylon, the delight of mine eyes, the excellency of my kingdoms, may at last forever sign Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar's goal was that his kingdom would last forever. And we've just summarized it here, may it last forever. But Daniel continued in his explanation. And you'll find it in verse 39. Babylon was the head of gold. But Babylon would not rule forever. To Nebuchadnezzar's chagrin, to Nebuchadnezzar's consternation. Verse 39, but, you should, but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. What does it mean that the next empire that rose after Babylon would be inferior? You may not be aware of it, but the Babylonians were extremely cultured. They developed science, and math. Medes and Persians were far less cultured. They were inferior in culture to the Babylonian Empire. Babylon ruled from 605 BC to 539 BC. It was then to be followed by another world ruling empire and the Medes and Persians overthrew the Babylonians. In this dream, God gives us a vision into the future. The Bible says, and after thee, after you shall arise another kingdom, Daniel, inferior to you. The Babylonian Empire would give way to the Medes and the Persians. Medes and Persians would be depicted in the silver. Now, you may wonder about that, and I want to read you. First, keep your finger in Daniel chapter 2, and the Bible names the Medes and Persians. We don't have to guess. Daniel chapter 5. You'll turn to Daniel chapter 5, verse 26, 27, and 28. Daniel 5, verse 26, 27, and 28. This is the interpretation of each word. Many, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. That's the nation of Babylon. Perish, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. So the Babylonian Empire would fall. The Medes and Persians would overthrow it. The Bible describes it. History tells it. Interestingly enough, in the book of Daniel, in chapter 8, we also read about the Medes and Persians attacking and overthrowing Babylon. And we read it in the Daniel chapter 8, 14 years before the event ever happened. Now, how did the Medes and Persians overthrow Babylon, and what significance does that have in prophecy? In 539 BC, Belshazzar, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, was throwing a great feast. Belshazzar was about 36 years old, and Daniel was in his mid-80s. Belshazzar's throwing this feast. Cyrus and the Persians, and Darius the Mede, Cyrus the Persians, had camped around Babylon. And as they camped around Babylon, the Babylonians were so confident. Remember I told you they had a constant water supply flowing through the city? And they also had a constant food supply 20 years. The Babylonians were so arrogant, they get up on the walls and threw food over the walls. Said, hey, you guys, you look hungry out there. You want something to eat? The Medes and Persians actually surrounded them. But Cyrus did a marvelous engineering feat. And this is what Cyrus did. The night that this party was going on, a bloodless hand wrote upon the wall. It was the hand of God. And it said, Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. How could that ever have happened? This is what happened. God had named Cyrus almost 150 years before this event ever happened. Now, Cyrus was the Persian general that attacked Babylon and overthrew it. I want to show you something amazing. Keep your finger here in Daniel chapter 2, or your marker, and turn to the book of Isaiah. Psalms, Proverbs, Isaiah. And we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45. The book of Isaiah was written in 680 B.C. 
That's 680 years before Christ. Babylon was overthrown in 539. So if you get 680, 539, it's about 141 years. So when you read Isaiah, you're reading about something that would take place 140 years in the future. Now I want you to read something that's interesting. Isaiah 45, verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. Who is God's anointed? Cyrus. What would, what would Cyrus do? Now Cyrus had not yet been born. He wouldn't be born for almost 100 years, and the event wouldn't happen for about 140 years in the future. Now, folks, this is incredible. To Cyrus, whose right hand I've beheld, to subdue nations before him. Cyrus would subdue nations. He would loose the armor of kings. He would open before him the double doors. Now, keep that in mind. He'll open before him the double doors. So the gates will not be shut. Keep that in mind. I will go before you. Now, go back up and look at something else that's interesting, the chapter before, Isaiah chapter 44, and look at the last part, uh, verse 27, who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up your rivers. So the river would be dry, who says of Cyrus, he's my shepherd, he'll perform my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, you'll be rebuilt into the temple, your foundation will be laid. So a man by the name of Cyrus would be born. He would dry up the river. He would come into Babylon and let the captives in Babylon from Jerusalem go free. Now remember, in 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar attacked Jerusalem, took Daniel captive. In 596 BC, he came back to Jerusalem, took 10,000 captives. In 586 BC, he destroyed all of Jerusalem. So, what do you have? Jerusalem's in captivity for 70 years. Like Jeremiah the prophet predicted. Cyrus was to attack, he attacked in 539, but by 536, from 606 to 536, the 70 year captivity is up now, and the captives go free. So God named Cyrus, over 100 years before he's born. God tells what Cyrus would do, he'd dry up the river. Well, what's all that about? You see it here in the Bible. Thus says the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I've holding to subdue nations. What does it mean he's going to loose the, open the gates? Cyrus was named approximately 150 years before his birth. Um, this is what he did. Cyrus saw the Euphrates River running through Babylon. So he dug large irrigation ditches far up the river. He drained the river off into the desert. The river dried up. So in that drunken feast, he took his armies and he marched him under the gates of Babylon. But what happened? When he came here into the city, there were also inner gates, but because of the drunken feast, those gates were not shut. The Bible predicted there would be Babylon, the golden empire it was. The Bible predicted the next nation that would rise would be Medo-Persia. It did. The Bible named specifically Cyrus as the king of Medo-Persia. He rose. The Bible said he'd dry up the river. He did. The Bible says the gates would not be shut. You say, how do we know for sure outside of the Bible? Do we have any historical confirmation outside of the Bible about this? We do. We do. This is called the Cyrus Cylinder. It's a barrel cylinder because you can see why it's shaped like a barrel. If you were visiting the British Museum in London today, you can, and I've seen it many times, we've photographed it, um, you would be able to see the Cyrus Cylinder. Now, the Cyrus Cylinder, the ancients often wrote in rock records, and you can see line after line. The Cyrus Cylinder describes Cyrus's overthrow of Babylon and his allowing the Jews to go free to rebuild the temple and rebuild the city, exactly like you find predicted in Scripture. You know, I was 17 years old, getting ready to go to university, looking for meaning and purpose in my life. And I wanted more than something that would give me a warm feeling in my heart. I wanted something that would last forever. As I began to study the Bible, and particularly the book of Daniel, it changed my life. 
And as I've lectured all over the world, I've seen it change people's lives. A number of years ago, after the fall of communism, when the Yeltsin government took over Russia, I was invited to come to the Kremlin. You know, where Andropov spoke, and where Khrushchev spoke, and where, where, uh, where Yeltsin spoke, the great Soviets. And to go into the Kremlin auditorium that seats 6,500 people, and to lecture on the Word of God. And it was an amazing experience. Every night we had two sessions, 6,500 one night, first session, 6,500 the second session. We had 13,000 people a night. And I was lecturing in the Communist Congress Party building, and there were many experiences we had there that I could spend the rest of the night telling you about. But after I gave this lecture that I'm giving tonight on the historicity of the Bible and Daniel chapter 2, uh, we had one lecture at five, one lecture at seven. I was sitting in a little room, eating some Russian borscht, trying to get strength for the second lecture. And the general that led the Afghan invasion, because you remember the Russians invaded Afghanistan. The general in charge of that invasion is a huge man. He's about 6'4", six, 6'5", six, I mean, really strong. Comes bursting in the room where I was sitting. You know, military uniform. He looks at me, he said, Dr. Finley. I said, yes, sir. Stood up. He reached his arms around, grabbed me. I mean, I thought I was going to crack in half. He just grabbed me and started hugging me. He looked me in the eye and he said this, a group of Russian intellectuals met after your meeting tonight. And after hearing that lecture that you gave, we believe that the, following the Bible is the only way forward for our nation. If we turn away from the truthfulness of the Word of God, our nation is going to be in trouble. One lecture on the historicity of the Bible, because he knew, he, he understood culture, he understood history, he understood the background, you see. So the Bible isn't a book for a lot of people that are intellectual ignoramuses that just don't think. But the more you study the Bible, the more you see it has substance. There's something solid about it, something you can stake your life on, something that's worth living for. So the Cyrus Cylinder, you see, the revelation of, of Cyrus named before his birth, but we continue. Medo-Persia ruled from 539 to 331 BC. But you remember what the Bible says. We're back in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. We're back there. Notice what scripture says. Verse 39. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. So after Babylon, another kingdom. God is giving the interpretation there would be kingdoms that would rise and fall. Then another third kingdom. Do you see where we're reading verse 39 of Daniel 2? Then another third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all of the earth. So the third kingdom of bronze. What nation overthrew Medo-Persia? Well, it was obviously Greece. Next, the third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over all the earth. And uh, the chief, of course, of Greece was Alexander the Great. Now, turn over here to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel 8 was written 200 years before the events of Greece ever happened. And I just want you to look at Daniel chapter 8. And although the symbolism changes in Daniel 8 to a ram and a he-goat, you're looking at Daniel 8 verse 20. The Bible is describing the nation that would overthrow Medo-Persia. What nation was that? Daniel 8 verse 20 and 21. The ram which you saw having the two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. The male goat is the king of Greece. The large horn that's between his eyes is the first king. Who was the first king of Greece? You know, who was that? Uh, again, who was the first king of Greece? Alexander. Alexander. I've got some good students tonight right in the front row. Alexander the Great. So it names Greece, and it says his first king. Let me ask you a question. How did the Bible know that Babylon would rule, but then it would fall and Medo-Persia would rule? How did the Bible no name Cyrus over 100 and some odd years in advance? How did the Bible know Cyrus would dry up the rivers? How did the Bible know that Cyrus uh, would, uh, the gates would be opened? Uh, how did the Bible know that, for example, that um, Greece would rise after the um, fall of, of Medo-Persia? And how, how did the Bible predict that 200 years in advance? The, what you're looking at in Daniel, chapter 8, is 200 years in advance. Now, I'll tell you something also quite fascinating. The prophecies of Daniel are so accurate that the critics, I mean the, the scholarly community, the intellectuals, so-called quote, quote, intellectuals, here's the way they get around this. 
The way they get around it is this. They say, we acknowledge that Daniel is really accurate. But because we don't accept miracles in the Bible and because we don't accept prophecy in the Bible, the pro these events are so accurate that the book of Daniel had to be written after the events took place. That's the way they get around it. But I'll tell you what blew that argument out of the water. In 1948, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. Now here's something you may be unaware of. Every book of the Old Testament, we even think now we have fragments of Esther in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have seven to eight copies of the book of Daniel, more than any other book except Isaiah. So we have seven to eight copies of Daniel. When you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls and you look at Daniel from the Dead Sea Scrolls and you begin to study the Aramaic of Daniel, it's the Aramaic of the 6th century, it's not the Aramaic of the... See, the first six chapters of Daniel are written largely from chapter 2 to chapter 7 is Aramaic. The rest of the book is Hebrew. So, but it's the Aramaic, it's the language of the 6th century, not the language of the 2nd century, because you know how language changes? Like, Look at Elizabethan English, thee and thou and so forth. You could tell when a person was born basically or the dialect that they were born in, what they speak. So the amazing thing here is the book of Daniel can be easily dated. The other thing is the details of the Babylonian Empire that Daniel gives could only be given by somebody who lived through the Babylonian Empire. So there's little question about the dating of Daniel today. So Alexander the Great, he is not named, but the Greek Empire is named 200 years in advance. Uh, bronze. The uh, Greeks had often used bronze armor, so the Bible uses symbols that are quite common, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. Then the Bible, um, one of the historians writing about the Greek Empire says, um, I'm persuaded that there was no nation, city, or people where his name, that is Alexander's name, did not reach. There seems to me have been some divine hand guiding or presiding over both his birth and actions. That's the historical library, book 16, chapter 12. In other words, even the historian recognizes that there's some divine movement. Something's going on here in the book of uh, Daniel and, and in the rise and fall of empires. But Greece would fall. The Bronze Empire would fall. Greece ruled from 331 to 168 B.C. The Bible then describes the fourth empire. You'll see it here in scripture. And uh, look at Daniel chapter 2. And notice it again. We're looking at Daniel, the second chapter. Daniel chapter 2. And there would be a fourth empire. Verse 40. And the fourth empire shall be strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters all things. And the iron that crushes that iron will break in pieces and crush all others. So the iron monarchy of Rome rises. Uh, Daniel chapter 2 verse 40 finally there'll be a fourth kingdom strong as iron of all the empires Rome was the strongest it certainly was the most extensive it went from Spain all across the Mediterranean into the Middle East went from Europe to Northern Africa so you have the fourth medal now notice four medals gold silver brass and iron Babylon Medo-Persia Greece and Rome the Roman Empire reigns supreme the Roman armies dominate the world during this time and uh, Rome becomes that leading capital of the world. Um, Rome rules from about 168 BC to the middle of the fourth century. Now here is something that is quite remarkable. Even secular historians who look at the book of Daniel and look at history compare history to the book of Daniel. The leading author of all of Roman history is Gibbon, Edward Gibbon, and he writes a book called, the a series of books called The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Have you ever heard of that series, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire? Now here's what he said. The images of gold, of silver, of, or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successfully broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. So even the historian recognizes in the image of Daniel chapter 2 the significance of the prophecies of the word of God. Now Rome would fall. Now look, if I were predicting, I would have predicted like this. If you, a human being were predicting, I would have predicted like this. Gold, silver, 
brass, iron, copper, tin, zinc, aluminum. I mean, the logical thing to do, wouldn't it be, is to keep predicting that another nation would rise. But what do you know about Rome? What do you know about Rome? Was Rome conquered by a fifth world ruling nation? What happened to Rome? It divided. So don't miss it. What does the Bible say? Verse 41. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be what? Divided. So the fourth kingdom, Rome, would be what, everybody? Divided. Yet the strength of iron shall be in it, just as iron is mixed with ceramic clay. As the toes of the image, the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom will be partly strong and partly broken. The Roman Empire was divided, the barbarian tribes came down from the north, and Europe was carved up, just like the Bible predicted. As you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, they'll mingle themselves with the seed of men. What does that mean? What does it mean to mingle the seeds? Intermarriage. The kings and queens of Europe would intermarry in an attempt to unite the empire. So there would be two ways they'd attempt to unite the empire, one through intermarriage and the other through war. But since Rome was divided, it has never been united again. What does the Bible say? And you saw iron mix, verse 43, with ceramic clay. They'll mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere or cling to one another, just as iron is not mixed with clay. Now look, let's go to the screen and look at it. Daniel 2.41, whereas thou sawest feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be what? What's the word, everybody? The kingdom shall be what? Divided. divided. So the Roman Empire would be divided. The barbarian tribes would come down from the north. There would be war and conflict and strife throughout the empire. And you know, the Alamanni came down. They settled in the area that we now know as what? Germany. The Burgundians settled in the area we now know as, France, as Switzerland. The Franks settled in the area we now know as France. The Lombards and Italy, the Saxons. What were the Anglo-Saxons? Where'd they settle, everybody? In England, right? The Suevi in Portugal, the Visigoths in Spanish, and the Heruli Vandals and Arthrogoths are now extinct. So when we look at Europe tonight, what do we see when we look at Europe? When we look at Europe, we see a divided empire. An empire that has been totally divided. And so you see the Franks, the Suevi, the Visigoths, and the Bible says that empire would be divided and it would never be reunited again. Have there been those that have tried to unite the Roman Empire? Have there been those that have tried to bring the empire together? Look, as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they'll mingle with the seed of men. Napoleon divorced Louise of Austria. And uh, to remarry, why? Because he wanted to unite all of Europe under the Napoleonic kin or the Napoleonic order. Um, you think of those that have tried to unite all of Europe. Would-be leaders have risen and fallen. Uh, I want to take you to Denmark. This is the Fredericksburg Castle. There's something interesting here I want you to see, so let's go into the castle together and make this discovery together. When you enter the doors of the Fredericksburg Castle, there's something called the Family Tree of Europe. And in this family tree of Europe, it shows how the major families of Europe attempted to intermarry, to mingle their seeds, if you please, to unite all of Europe under one political empire. Isn't it fascinating that Bible prophecy is so incredibly accurate? Isn't it fascinating that we even today have what's known as the family tree of Europe showing the intermingling of seeds where you have the attempt to unite all of Europe with the, here's King Frederick in his attempt to, to, he marries Queen Diana, why? So that their children can have the royal seed for all of Europe. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not unite one to the other. The Bible says they would not cleave one to the other. I remember being in Europe preaching in Munich, skeptic says, how do you know the Bible's true? And I said, well, it's very simple, you're standing on it. He said, what do you mean you're standing on it? I said, well, you're standing on the very ground that indicates the Bible is true, because Europe has been divided and there have been those that have tried to unite it. There's been Charlemagne, Charles V, Hitler, Mussolini, 
The European common market attempted to unite it economically, but Europe is still a very, very divided continent because the Bible says they shall not cleave one to the other. Whether it is Charles V, oh, they shall not cleave. Whether it's other would-be world rulers, they shall not cleave. Whether it's Napoleon, you know, when Napoleon was defeated in the Battle of Waterloo, 1815, he said, God Almighty is too much for me. The Bible is very clear that Europe would not be reunited again. We are not living in the head of gold. We're not living in the breast and arms of silver. We're not living in the thighs of brass. We're not living in the legs of iron. But now we're living down at the iron and clay. You know, when you look at that image, you go from gold at the top to iron and clay at the bottom. And uh, iron and clay feet are not very stable. All of society is quite, quite shaky today, and you know that. The Bible says that, that um, we're entering into times that will be very traumatic just before the coming of Jesus but we can be confident that this world is in the hands of God. If God has been guiding history for 2,500 years, he's certainly guiding the military leaders today. Um, the military leaders today that want to grasp at this world fail to recognize that this world is in the hands of God, that God has an eternal purpose for this world. Remember what the Bible says? It says in the days of these kings, in the days of divided Europe, something would happen. What would happen? The dream is certain, the interpretation is sure. What is the final interpretation? Look at verse 44. The days of these kings, that's the days of divided Europe, were not in the head of gold, Babylon, were not in the breast and arms of silver, Medo-Persia, were not in the thighs of brass, Greece, were not in the legs of iron, Rome. Europe was divided uh, over 1,500 years ago. But notice verse 44, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that'll never be destroyed and the kingdom will not be left to other people. It'll break in, into pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever and ever and ever. Here's the incredible good news. The history of this world is in God's hands and the rock that smites the image is not some thermonuclear war. The rock that smites the image is not some catastrophe. It's not some comet that hits earth. The rock that smites the image, according to the Bible, is the kingdom of God that fills the whole world. And the incredible good news is, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break and consume all these pieces, kingdoms, and it shall stand forever and ever and ever. This rock is Christ's eternal, everlasting kingdom. And here is the marvelous good news. This world is in the hands of God. When the trauma and conflict is all around us, as we see it today, the instability of the economy. You know, when you look at the fact of America being $20 trillion in debt, the best political leaders, I say the best political leaders, are going to have a difficult time leading us out of this problem that we're in. When you look at the natural disasters that are hitting, tornadoes, famines, earthquakes, conflict, we're in deep trouble in this world, folk. We're in deep trouble. As I travel the world and I see the instability of this world, but my heart is at peace because I know that this world is in the hands of God. It kind of reminds me of a story. At the end of the, during the Second World War, London was being bombed. It was bombed terribly. Every night the bombers would fly over and bomb London. And there was a father and his little nine-year-old daughter. And they were deep under the earth in a bomb shelter. The mother of that family had been killed in a previous bombing raid. And the two sisters had been killed. And now just the father and the little girl was left. And Hitler's tanks, Hitler's bombers were bombing and the earth was shaking and the blasts were going off and the buildings were crumbling. And this father and his nine-year-old daughter were in the bomb shelter and he reached over and took her hand and she was crying and she said, Daddy, Daddy, hold me my hand and hold it tight. He said, I've got you. He put his arm around her and she said, Daddy, Daddy. She said, I've got you, honey. She said, but I'm afraid. He said, go off to sleep. And she said, Daddy, I can't sleep unless I know your face is turned toward me. I can't sleep unless I know your face is turned toward me. God hasn't forgotten planet Earth. His face is turned toward it. We need not fear because this world is in God's hands. The future is in God's hands. And one day Jesus will come. And there'll be no more sickness or suffering, no more heartache or death no more sorrow, no more famine, no more cancer, no more heart disease. The incredible good news is this. The Prince of Peace can give us peace in our hearts 
and he will come again soon. Hey everybody, Matt Gray here, media director for Hope Lives 365. Don't go yet. Make sure that you subscribe and click the bell so you get notified of the next video in this series. And I think you should check out these other videos over there. I think you'll like those as well. See ya.